So I will talk about the question, is free banking in quotation marks stable? And uh, I will build on Professor Hobner's lecture that explained already the fundamentals of, uh, of banking, fraction reserve banking. The topic is, of course, a very hot topic. There are, there are people that actually got, get very nervous when they talk about, about it behave like little kids um, and it's important because oh, well-intentioned libertarians and actually good economists are misled uh, in, this, in this question. They are confused on the issue. So what we will, so I think it's highly important that you are here today. Um, what we will do, we will define free banking then see if free banking is really free and ethical. We will discuss uh, clearing as a limit for credit expansion in a fractional reserve banking system. And if coordination is possible. And then why fractional reserve banking credit expansion is harmful. Even though some people say, say the opposite. So why the co quotation marks? Because the normal definition that many employ is, they say free banking is a fractional reserve banking system without a central bank. So the free consists in saying without a central bank. But of course, the, the important underlying question is, is it free in the sense that pro property rights are protected by the legal system? Huh? <clears throat> Otherwise, it would be saying like, something like free taxation, it would be like an oxym oxymoron, no? It's said, no? It could be, no? And uh, it's very important to point out that valid contracts must comply with uh, legal principles. Um, it is many libertarians uh, just intuitively, and uh, I guess it, it is very intuitive, they think that every voluntary agreed upon contract is a valid, valid contract. So if people do it voluntarily, so it must be okay in a free society. However, there are f f uh, voluntary agreed, uh, agreed upon contracts that are not valid and that would not be enforced in a free society. Let's say I, I hire Tyler for $1,000 to kill Jason. <laughs> we voluntarily agree on the contract. It's a voluntary agree upon contract, but is it a valid contract? It's a question. I can choose. <laughs> but let's say let's say I pay the one thousand uh, dollars to Tyler, and Tyler Tyler then say says, "No, I won't kill him." And then I go to court and say, "Hey, I have a valid contract. Enforce it. Enforce the contract, court." Do you think in a free society the contract would be enforced? Probably not. Uh, another example of a voluntary agreed upon contract would be <laughs> I, I, I see a three-year-old boy on the street and I say, hey, I have here a cool uh, plastic car to play with. Uh, it's yours. Uh, you pay me $1 million when you turn 18. Sign this for me. <laughs> And of course, uh, the boy voluntarily <laughs> thinks that it's the best deal of his life, signs it. <laughs> Probably it would not be enforced either in a free society, you know. Um, last example of voluntary, voluntarily agreed upon contracts that are unvalid are those that are impossible to fulfill. You know? If I, if I uh, tell Tyler I sell you a squared circle uh, for $1,000 and he, he pays me $1,000 and then I don't deliver. He goes to court and says, court, please enforce this contract. Just hard to enforce. No? <laughs> or if, if someone sells, uh, if I sell Tyler a weekend trip, a weekend trip to Pluto, no? the planet Pluto where now the NASA sent. So, just next weekend, you go, uh, I, I sell your trip back uh, uh, there. So it's impossible to fulfill. Um, 
So in, in Latin, the principle is ultra posse nemo obligatur, which means that you cannot f uh, f enforce something that is impossible to fulfill. Uh, other legal principles are pacta sunt servanda, uh, contracts have to be fulfilled, or in dubio pro, pro reo, which means that uh, the accused, uh, the, is there's doubt for him, no? You, ha uh, you have to prove that he's guilty, eh? he's innocent from a priori. So, um, for a valid contract, um, legal principles must be fulfilled. That, that is, even though they may be voluntarily agreed upon, the legal principles must be fulfilled. So, what are the legal differences between deposits and loan contracts? Um, I built here on Huerta de Soto. In a deposit contract, the essential element of the contract is uh, the custody and safekeeping. People want to maintain full availability of their deposited goods. That's the intention, that's the purpose, the subjective purpose in these contracts. While in a loan contract, it's the opposite. I don't want to maintain maintainability, I transfer the, maintain, uh, the availability um, of the good, of money, for example, for a certain time to another person and I lose the availability. So in a demand deposit contract, or in a deposit contract, there's no term because it's available at all times, uh, implied in the custody and safekeeping. And in the loan contract, of course, there's a term. There's always a term because I relinquish the availability of uh, of the good for a certain time. If there would be not a would be not a term, it would be a gift. No? Um, and the obligation stemming from the essential elements of the contracts is in a, a demand deposit contract is to maintain full reserves, 100% reserves at all times. Otherwise, the intention, the purpose of the contract will, would not be fulfilled. While in the loan contract, the person who receives the loan has only the obligation to return the good at the end of the term plus the agreed upon interest. So now we can assess um, or interpret fractional reserve banking. There are several um, possible interpretations depending on the subjective beliefs of the, of, of the parties. So the, the first one is that, well, the depositor, he wants to maintain full availability. He wants to always be able to use his money. It's, the money forms part of his cash balance that is deposited at the bank. Uh, the, depositor, the banker knows that, is, that it is a deposit. He knows that he should maintain 100% reserves, but secretly he takes part of the money and lends it out, for example. This historically has been uh, the origin of fractional reserve banking. And it's, this, is, this is plain fraud. No? Because the banker pretends that, it's, that he maintains 100% reserves and he does not. Uh, this is how fractional reserve banking arose. Then the next interpretation is more favorable to the banker because um, here, of course, the motivation of the depositor is the same, but the banker um, receives the money as if it would be a loan. He thinks it's a loan. He thinks that the dep uh, depositor gives him the money as if it would be a loan and he could use it. So this is an example of maybe older people today, today who actually think that their money is in the bank <laughs> and it's not. No. And, they, and they have, uh, we have no meeting of the mind because one party thinks, uh, the grandma thinks the banker has 100% reserves, has my money there in the bank, it's physically there, and the banker thinks he gets a loan that he can use as he wishes. So. Uh, there's no valid contract either. Or there is no valid contract because there's no meeting of the mind. The two parties have, uh, have purposes that are impossible, that are um, incompatible. Um, the next um, interpretation is what, we, what many people have today and what free bankers or fractional reserve bankers allude to is that uh, the depositor he wants to maintain full availability, probably most people today uh, want to have full availability of the, the money that is on their checking account, but they know that 
to some extent that the banker will use it. Uh, they know that it will be used. And the banker receives the money as if, if it, as it would be a loan. So then here we have uh, a case of uh, an incompatible contract. Uh, the causes, the motivation of the contract are in incompatible. And it's null and void because of that. Why is it incompatible, the motivation? Because if the depositor wants to maintain full availability, if this is the purpose of the contract, and this is the purpose in the deposit contract, this is incompatible with the banker using um, the, uh, the money. And moreover, even if the motivations would be compatible, it's impossible to fulfill the contract. The depositor, depositor cannot have full availability if the banker uses the money because it's physically impossible that one uh, monetary unit is used by two persons at the same time. Mm -hmm. so, so this about the um, uh, legal assessment of fractional reserve banking. Um, so you see that fractional reserve banking violates legal pr principles. Uh, this, in the same way as uh, I contract Tyler to, to kill Jason or with, with, the, li, with, with the boy or uh, the squared circle contract, it violates um, legal contract uh, principles and only exists because the government has given, had, ha, has legalized this pr practice, this legal aberration. So this on free banking in quotation marks, free banking implies a real free banking without quotation marks, of course, implies that property rights are upheld and there are only legal valid contracts, so there's full reserve banking. And full reserve banking is stable in the sense that bank runs are no problem. If all depositors come at the same time, they will always get their money. Uh, of course, a bank can go bankrupt. For example, if a bank uh, uh, has a loan business and borrows on the one hand and lends on the other hand, and the lenders cannot pay back, so they are bad loans, uh, or it's mismatching maturities, it borrows shorts and lends long and cannot renew short-term loans, so it can go bust. But if it has full reserves, the depositors will always get their money. Who lose their money are the, the creditors and shareholders. Mm. And it's stable also in the fact there's no, there's no domino effect in the sense that one, if one bank goes bust, this does not endanger the f stability of other banks. No? It does not induce depositors to uh, ran, run on other banks. And even if it would, they would not fall due to this, as is today. No? As is today, if one fraction of bank, or today without central banks, if one bank fails, then probably other bank banks will also fall in a domino effect. So is fractional reserve banking stable without a central bank? Mises writes in Human Action, the issuance of fiduciary media, no matter what its quantity may be, always, always <coughs> sets in motion those changes in the price structure, the descri description of which is the task of the theory of the trade cycle. Of course, if the additional amount issued is not large, neither are the inevitable effects of the expansion. So Mises clearly says that if there's credit expansion, uh, which is possible in a fractional reserve banking system, there are always, there's always a tendency towards the business cycle. He says, okay, if it's only a little bit, then the effects are not so strong, but there are always these effects. So when a bank appropriates the deposited funds and lends them, um, there has been no additional real savings. Um, but there are new investments, even though there are not more real savings. There is an unsustainable boom, as you have heard uh, this week more than once, I guess. And in the, in the bust, then, the, the assets of the banks lose in value. There are losses for the banks, and then the, the, de um, the depositors or and bank customers lose co trust in the bank, and they come uh, to withdraw their deposits. 
ultimately, co ultimately causing a bank run. So, in other words, the fraction reserve banking system itself s sets uh, uh, into motion a process of boom and bust, and in the bust, they ultimately get problems. First liquidity and then solvency problems. So, in a sense, the fraction reserve banking system sows the seeds of its own demise because it causes a boom and a bust, and in the bust, it gets into problems. Therefore, uh, the answer is no. no. Now to the question if credit expansion is limited by free banking, and here we will talk about the uh, clearing mechanism. So let's say we have two banks, Bank A and Bank B. They have both reserves of 100 gold ounces, for example, and then they engage in credit expansion. Um, uh, one bank uh, issues a bank note of uh, 100 gold ounces, the other one only of 50. Um, it goes to the customer of bank, bank A. The bank A customer uses the 100 to pay, uh, to buy something from, from this guy, the customer of bank B. And the bank B customer uses his 50, Euro, 50 ounces to buy something from the green one. So what happens is uh, yeah, he brings his 100 to, to his bank. And the 50, he brings the 50 to his bank and deposits the money there. Bank A has now the bank note from bank B, and bank B has now the bank note from bank A, and then they make a clearing. They make a clearing of reserves, and the difference is, of course, that bank A has to pay 50 gold ounces to bank, bank B. This is the clearing. So, mm, fractional reserve bankers say that this uh, this is the limit on credit expansion because if one bank expands more credits than the other, more credits than the others, like in this example, the bank that expands credits more than the other loses reserves. And if it, if it continues to lose reserves, it will go bust. It's, uh, it will be li illiquid at some point. So this is the limit for credit expansion. Of course, there's no limit if they do it in a coordinated way, because then no one loses reserves if they both expand 100. No? Uh, they, then they flow to the other a bank and then do a clearing. The clearing is no reserves uh, go, flow from one bank to the others. The, the only thing is happen what is happening is that the reserve ratio of bo both banks is, uh, is falling, but there's no loss of reserves. So. They can, they, so there is no limit for credit ex expansion if there is a coordinated credit expansion. It must not, and this must not be simultaneously. This can also also be in thick thick thug. So uh, if you go back to the first example, uh, where one bank expands 100, the other 50, and then before clearing, the bank that expanded less says, okay, then I, I also expand 50 more. Uh, so it can be in this way. Now, now the last line. Some, so the last line of defense of fresh reserve bankers is then they admit, okay, cooperation is possible, but it's not very likely. It would be a cartel. It would be a collusion, and uh, in a free market, this is unstable. Without the central bank, <laughs> it is unstable. And it's of course true that it's more stable with central banks. That is why fraction reserve banks ask the government to install central banks. No. Okay, um, what about this argument of cartels, that cartels are instable? Oh, here, here we have Mises. Uh, yeah, he's, he says the same thing. The quantity of fiduciary media in circulation has no natural limits. So the credit expansion has no natural limits if it's done co in coordination. If for any reason it is desired that it should be limited, then it must be limited by some deliberate human intervention that is banking policy. Okay, so is fractional reserve banking instable? And here the answer is that uh, 
collusion in or cartels in the private sector are unstable. But here we have a violation of property rights, as we saw before. Therefore, we had to start with the legal analysis. No? Collusion between criminals is more stable. No? We have the mafia, for example, in different regions of Italy, cooperating, uh, colluding, separating their regions for a long time. <laughs> it's quite stable. <laughs> eh? It's quite stable. Um, or imagine two, two counterfeiters, that we have two, two counterfeiters. Uh, they both know each other, but they don't go to the police. Why not? Um, they are criminals cooperating. Uh, they are criminals cooperating. And this can, this can be stable. This can be stable. Or, or governments. Governments of different countries. So uh, if one government is more precious than the other, has higher tax rates, people and companies sh would leave the uh, country with the higher taxes to live in the country with the lower tax rates. Until, in theory, all people have lost the country with the, which is more oppressive to live in the country which is less uh, oppressive. So the more oppressive states would collapse. Um, that's a similar argument. No? So if, if one bank is more aggressive with credit expansion, or if one government is more aggressive with taxation, the government will lose taxpayers, will lose uh, citizens to countries that are less aggressive with taxation. Here we have uh, fractions of banks that are, that are more aggressive with uh, uh, credit expansion. They will lose reserves to banks that are less um, aggressive. So, and in, in, in practice, we see that governments, uh, more oppressive governments, do not collapse in this way. So, uh, cartelization is there possible also, even though it's not formal. Um, the overall interest of all governments is the same to increase in size and to collude. Actually, there's a tendency towards a world government. Mm -hmm. And there has been a long run growth of government. Which, so, there is no limit. In the same sense, there's no limit for credit expansion, theoretically, there's no limit for government growth. Huh? Of course, the way uh, banks exploit people un is not taxation, but credit expansion. No? And it's not outright violence, but just the use of invalid contracts. Huh? And the limits for credit expansion at the end are then high is then hyperinflation, which the banking system does not want. And for the governments, the limits for oppression is the uh, revolution. No? OK. So uh, the conclusion is that the cartel of criminals is, uh, can be stable since, since they exploit their customers. And the customers cannot go so easily to a non-criminal organization if it does not exist. So there's a strong incentive to uh, collude. OK, um, let's uh, now turn to George Selgin's argument that fractional reserve banking would be, uh, in fact, beneficial and would not be harmful. He argues that fractional reserve banking keeps uh, free fractional reserve banking, so fractional reserve banking without a central bank, keeps MV constant. MV is, uh, in, in the equation of exchange, is M is the money supply, V is the uh, um, Velocity of circulation, P is the price level, and T are transactions. So he says, if people redeem less banknotes, uh, if they increase their, want to increase their cash balances, they go uh, fewer times to the bank to redeem the money. The velocity of circulation goes down. To compensate this, the banking system, free banking system, will increase. Uh, credit expansion and hold, holding MV constant. So, yeah, this is what he says. When, when the demand for money increases, people redeem, redeem fewer banknotes. Banks may and should expand credit so MV stays constant. And uh, he says, uh, even if banks expand, in, expand credits in the same rhythm, 
Even if they do not lose reserves to competitors, even if there's no adverse clearing, there is another limit for credit expansion. Because he says uh, the bank's demand for reserves is the average net reserve demand. Um, if all banks expand in the same rhythm, it's zero. No one loses reserves in the long term. But there's also a precautionary reserve demand um, in relation to, in function of the variation of the clearing, variation of the variance of the clearing balances. Uh, there you have to think of, uh, let's say the clearing, clearing period is one day after, end, after at the end of each day, banks uh, clear. Um, but of course, it could be that uh, one day the bank has a positive clearing balance, the next day it has a negative one. In the long run, it compensates if there's coordinated credit expansion, but there may be one day where we where lose reserves. So Sajin says, you also need some, res uh, some precautionary reserves for this vari vari variance, variance. And this variance, of course, goes up the more credit expansion has occur occurred already, the, the bigger the money supply is. And so he says there's this, uh, this limit. Okay, uh, what, is this true? No. Um, why? Why is it not a limit necessarily? Because uh, even though up at the end of the day, one bank may have a positive clearing balance, a positive variance, it may voluntarily refrain from redemption. If banks really co coordinate, co cooperate, they may voluntarily refrain from it. Another possibility similar to this is an interbank, interbank market. Uh, banks know that in the long run, they will expand in the same, or they want to expand in the same rhythm. They cooperate, they collude. Um, so they give them short-term short -term loans. A bank with a positive clearing balance lends to a bank with a negative one. Or they could just lengthen the clearing balance instead of uh, clearing at the end of every day, they could do it at the end of every week or month. So if credit expansion expands, progressively you may also expand the clearing period. And then it actually may be that when there is credit expansion, uh, there typically is an artificial boom. So the assets of banks increase during the coordinated credit expansion. And as the assets of banks increase in value, the stock portfolio goes up, they may actually think that they need less reserves. Huh? Well, Selgin and White, they say that uh, yeah, in a fractional reserve banking system, which is on its limit, it has reached its, its limit of credit expansion, uh, there, it would not be harmful. No? Of course, one would, one would first have to ask <laughs> the process until reaching the limit uh, was this not distortionary? But okay, even if we are at the, the, the so-called limit, what happens if there's an increase in base money production? So, for example, we have a gold standard and people uh, deposit gold in the fractional reserve banking system. This allows the banks for more credit expansion, even though there have been no more real savings. There has been just an increase in the money supply, but not real resources to maintain uh, the production process. The second reason, which they all, for the second possibility that they acknowledge, is if there's a demand to hold money, an increased demand to hold cash balances, then they actually say the extraction reserve banks should expand credits. And Mises says any credit expansion leads to a tendency of a business cycle. No? And again, th this is what we have talked about now quite a bit, is it is possible that banks cooperate, expand in the same rhythm, reducing their reser reserve ratios. Why do Selgin and White think that this would not be harmful? But Se Selgin says that the willingness to hold money the willingness to hold uh, bank liabilities, to have a checking account, is 
the, equal to the willingness to save. So if the demand for money increases, or decrease in velocity you know, in the equation, then the fractional reserve banking should produce more money and could produce more money because people basically save more. And it's true, if there's credit expansion, then there are more monetary savings and more investments, but not more real savings. If people want to hold more money, if they want to have a higher cash balance, this not necessarily means that the time preference has changed or the time preference has fallen. It does not mean that there are more savings and that more investment projects can be undertaken, which will be undertaken in the system envisioned uh, by fractional reserve free bankers. In their system, when people want to hold more money, fractional reserve banks expand, expand credits. But not necessarily there are more real savings, which we will see now. And there's a confusion. Huh? That, that is the main confusion, I, I think, between savings, re-savings, and the demand to hold money. It's a confusion of a stock and a flow variable. Cash holdings of people, cash balances, this is a stock variable. But saving is a flow variable. Saving is the proportion of unconsumed income. Right? The proportion of income which is not consumed. So it's a flow variable. It's like every year right? or every income period. While the cash holdings is a stock variable. And they think that if when the stock variable increases, the fractional reserve banking expands credits, people hold more banknotes, it's an increase in savings in the flow variable. And this is a fundamental error. It's a very obvious error, error actually. <coughs> and m m even, maybe even more importantly, people can increase their cash balances by de decreasing their saving, by the de divestment. And this investment, an example. Assume an, 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 an entrepreneur that has a factory with 10 machines. Uh, oh, one, machines one machine breaks, kaput, every year. Uh, to buy it new, it costs $50. 50, uh, 50. The entrepreneur has an income per year of $100. He consumes 50 and uses $50 to replace the mach broken machine. Then the next, oh, she does it for, he does it for many years. No? The capital stock remains the same, no? the same production, same income. And then next year, next year. Uh, then he says, I want to I increase my demand for money. I want to hold, because uncertainty has increased or whatever, I want to hold a higher cash balance. So he says, uh, instead of buying uh, the, the normal machine of $50, I will buy a smaller one of, for $30 and use $20 to increase my cash balance. Huh? So what is the result? The result is nominal savings have been reduced. The proportion of income that is saved and invested has fallen from 50 to 30. Savings have been reduced. The, the flow variable is smaller. Consumption spending has uh, increased relatively to investment spending. Uh, it's not 50% anymore, but, but more. And cash holdings, which for Selgin and White is savings, have increased. Uh, so what are the effects in the economy? Now here you have the smaller machine. Um, one is that the prices of consumer goods will rise relatively to the prices of machines, to the prices of consumer goods, uh, producers' goods. Which also means that the interest rate, interest rate will increase, <coughs> which is of, of course just a re reflection of the fact that here the individual has increased its, his uh, time preference. He's consuming, uh, he's investing, saving a, s a smaller portion of his income than before in relation to his consumption expenditures. So we have this result, interest rate rises, time preference has increased, uh, what would a fractional reserve banking system do? 
the demand to hold cash balances has increased. Um, this guy holds $20 more in form of demand deposits or bank notes. And then, then the then Sajin would say, okay, the demand to hold money has increased, <coughs> which means that velocity has fallen, so to compensate, money supply should go up. And the fractional reserve banking system can expand credit because uh, people demand, or this individual demands to hold a higher cash balance, to hold more bank liabilities. So there will be a credit expansion to finance new investment projects, which obviously is against the intentions of the individuals. The individual, what did he want? He wanted, or what, are, what does he do? He actually reduces his investment, he buys a smaller machine, and now the, the reaction of the fractional reserve bank is just to expand credit for, for, for new additional investment projects, even though his saving has not, his real saving has not increased. You see that his real saving has not increased, his consumption spending has increased relatively to his savings. So it's the opposite. It's a clear discoordination here, um, which uh, uh, fractional reserve bankers fail to see. So, uh, I mean, the, the main difference is that we, or I regard saving not merely as holding money, as a stock variable, but as a, as a portion of income which is not consumed. No? This, this is the main difference. And here, here they have the flaws. This is the origin of the flaws. Uh, and there's no necessary correlation between the portion of the unconsumed real income, uh, the unconsumed real income, and, uh, and uh, the cash balance. Uh, so an individual may consume a larger portion of his real in income by disinvesting, as is here the example. Uh, here, here we have it, to quote him, to hold inside money is to engage in voluntary saving. I mean, this is clearest evidence possible, no? To hold inside money is to engage in voluntary saving. For him, if we go back, to hold this additional $20 in demand deposits is additional saving. So banks can expand credit. Uh, uh, another problem in his argument is, of course, that the banks will uh, expand credit more than this $20. But okay. So here we have another example to show our dif difference between uh, saving, real saving as a flow variable, and the demand to hold cash or to hold money as a, as a stock variable. L let's imagine a person. He has cash, cash holdings of $1,000, a yearly in income of 10000 he consumes all of it. Person A has savings of $10,000, but is he saving? No, he's not saving at all. And so here we have the difference be between unconsumed real income. There's no saving in this example. And the stock of monetary savings for Seljin, there, there are savings of $1,000. And for him, the increase of, of other Free bank, fractional reserve free bankers, the increase of demand to hold monetary savings, like let's assume that the fractional reserve bank expand credits and now his savings go up to 2,000, is, is an increase in real savings, even though there have been no, no, no extension from, real, uh, from, com, from consumption. Another question is, uh, which is of course difficult for answer for Fraction reserve free bankers. Let's assume we, we, we live in a fraction reserve banking system. It is at its, at its limit of credit expansion. Uh, it has reached it. It's like in kind of equilibrium. But there's one guy uh, who had money and cash below his mattress for 10 years, his savings, 1,000. And now, for some reason, because there was a some robbery in his neighborhood, he starts to, uh, he says, okay, I will take it from below, from below the mattress and put it into the bank. Has real savings changed? Are there more real resources available f to sustain additional investment projects? Obviously not, just the 
stock, so savings have changed location from below the mattress to the banking system. But what will the fractional reserve banking system do with the additional reserves? Expand credits. And not only 1,000, but more. And interest rates will fall. Additional investment projects will be started. But there has been no more real savings. OK, he, he, he did not really respond to our argument that I had with uh, David Howden. Uh, so he was evasive. Mm, he said, um, it may be that a person just changes the form of saving. So he did not refer to the case of the mattress, but he said there may be a bond that a person has. And then he sells the bond and deposits the money. Then the bank reserves increase. Or he, he accepts a banknote in exchange. So, uh, uh, so just the, the form of the financial asset changes. The, the individual does not hold the bond anymore, but he holds a bank liability, a banknote. Uh, and then it's OK that the bank lends the money because it's just a different form of saving. Uh, and if it would not lend the money, actually, he says that the interest rate would be too high. So um, what is the critique of uh, this argument? Well, first of all, he did not address the example of the mattress, obviously. He just said that another example. But even here, uh, there are problems. The first problem is if someone holds a bond, a 10-year bo bond, and sells it because he wants to, for example, in three months he wants to go on a vacation, or in three months he wants to buy a tele new television set. Um, it's not equivalent. It's not equivalent to the, the, the two investments. In the bond, the, the person is abstaining 10 years from co consumption if he holds to matru uh, maturity. If he, incre if he takes the bank notes or an increase in the de demand deposit, deposits the money, he may actually want to increase consumption very soon, go on a vacation. And if the fraction reserve bank then takes the money to, to, to grant a credit and it, it is invested for investment project that matures within 10 years, there's obviously a discoordination. In fact, if an individual that, were, that was willing to abstain 10 years from, uh, from consumption holding this bond now deposits the money in his bank, it's actually an increase in time preference rate. Uh, he's not willing to abstain so long anymore. If then the, the, the banking system expands credits and there will be investment project that takes 10 years to major, there's a discoordination. And of course, his response was also evasive because one can increase uh, real cash balances not only by selling an, a financial asset, not only by selling a bond, but also by divestment from real capital. No? The divestment example is the one of the machines. No? He did not answer to this example. So the conclusion is that free banking uh, is stable. Free, free banking quotation marks or fractional reserve banking is unstable because it allows for credit expansion. And as Mises says, all credit expansion leads to the development of an uh, unsustainable boom. Um, uh, the, three, the three reasons is for why it allows for credit suspension in a fraction of the banking system is there may be an increased demand to hold money. Then free bankers themselves even say that free banking system should increase the money supply. There may be an increase in base money, which allows for credit suspension, or there can be cooperation that we talked about. And in all these cases, in all these cases of credit expansion, there has been no increase in real saving to sustain the additional investment projects that are uh, financed via credit expansion. So there are unsustainable booms. Unstable. Yeah, it <laughs> becomes really <laughs> unstable until then the banks ask for the introduction of a central bank, the lender of last resort. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>